Good morning and welcome to worship. It's good to see each of you here today. A special word of welcome to visitors in our midst. We're glad to have you. I invite your prayers for 50 members of our congregation who are at Christian Community Camp today in Estes Park, Colorado. They began last night, a week-long um, camp that's always a highlight in the life of the church. We look forward to welcoming, welcoming them back next Sunday. Next Sunday is also a special reception after each service honoring the service of Laura Shop, who's been a faithful servant of the church for the last 15 years. Um, and so I hope you'll be here to celebrate her ministry among us over the last years. Um, if you have any interest at all in going to Ecuador with our mission trip team for adults this fall, I would encourage you to contact Tyler Heston or call the church office and we'll get you more information. We'd like to finalize that group here in the next couple of weeks and this is an excellent opportunity to, to serve and learn more about the Disciples of Christ mission work around the globe. Um, you can read the other activities there in the bulletin, or if you're worshiping with us online this morning, I encourage you to go to the website and look at the opportunities for engagement and sharing and ministry together. But at this time, I would invite you to greet those around you with signs of God's grace and peace. Our God is strong like a rock. We come to worship the God of refuge. Our God cares for the ones the world forgets. We come to worship the God of justice. Our God is the one who gives life. We come to worship the God of joy. Come, let us worship God. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from Psalm 85. You have been gracious to your land, O Lord. You have restored the good fortune of Jacob. You have forgiven all the iniquity of your people and blotted out all their sins. You have withdrawn all your fury and turned yourself from your wrathful indignation. Restore us then, O God, our Savior. Let your anger depart from us. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. 
I will listen to what you, Lord God, are saying. For you are speaking peace to your faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to you. If you have not had a chance to do so yet, I invite you to sign the friendship registers that are located in the center aisle and pass those to the other folks in the aisle with you. And if you're online, you can do that through our website, our application. You know, this past week uh, on Thursday and Friday, we had all the school teachers here to get all those free supplies that Scraps KC has brought to our church over the last couple of weeks. I, I can't describe, the, the social hall was just literally bursting at the seams with goodies that the teachers could get when a small army of volunteers from the church here and from other uh, organizations and groups came and sorted and cleaned and, and got things ready. And then on Thursday and Friday, teachers could come and get free supplies to take back to their classrooms as they get ready for the new academic year. That was made possible by a lot of volunteer effort here of our members and others. And it was also made possible by the fact that we have this beautiful building that we can make available to other, other kinds of entities, other groups and organizations, even churches to come and to do God's work. That's all made possible by our gifts of time and talent and treasure. As we receive the offering this morning. Let us do so mindful of all the ways that God blesses us. From the love of my own comfort From the fear of having nothing From a life of worldly passions Deliver me, O oh God From the need to Understood, and from a need to be accepted, from the fear of being lonely, deliver me, O oh God, deliver me. From the fear of serving others And from the fear of death or trial And from the fear of humility
may be seated. In the passage that we will read from the book of James in just a moment, James tells us that in this world we have conflict and we have war and we have jealousy. In other words, life can be a mess. And then James says, but God's grace is even greater. And so as we come to this table this morning, whatever broken places there are in our own lives or in our own world are welcome here at this table because at this table we receive the good news that God's grace is even greater. Let us prepare ourselves for this holy meal as we sing together our communion hymn. On the same night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his friends, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. And after the supper, he took out a cup and said, This cup is the new covenant of God's love. It is for you and for many. Do this, remembering me. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we live in a world that can't possibly be to your liking with all of the discord hate and war that surrounds us every day. The quarreling and disagreements seem to be never ending. It's miserably hot and tempers flare on a variety of issues. But the scripture for today says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Help every one of us to move in that direction in order to make that statement a reality. So this world of yours becomes more loving and caring and our relationship with you becomes the driving force in our lives. In Jesus name we pray, amen.
cup of Christ for all. As we continue our prayer this morning, we are reminded of all those who we have promised to pray for in those situations that we have promised to pray for in this past week. And so we gather those to our hearts now. And of course, you're always welcome to call our daily prayer line and leave a prayer request that may be a joy or a concern. We would be honored to pray with you. God, you who gently guides our lifelong self-discovery, in this moment of quiet, one might ask, I wonder how would I be recognized if not through the eyes of another? How would I speak if not for the response of another? How would my dance resonate if there was no one to sense the motion? How would my laughter or my anguish be joined if not by the presence of another? O oh God, you have fashioned us so that we mirror one another we behold and listen to one another. We dance and sing. We worry and weep with one another. We instinctively know that we belong to each other and to you. We are all your beautiful children. For reasons that defy a satisfactory explanation, we do not live in the perfect harmony and peace that seems as though it would naturally flow from your gift of life and community. Through your sustaining grace and boundless mercy, empower us and help us choose to recognize one another as expressions of your love. Help us seek to identify and heal that in our personal lives and our social constructs, which separate us from one another, from your creation, and from you. And now we lift all of our prayers, spoken and those held in the depths of our hearts, as together we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today is our final sermon on the James series, which talks about spirituality for the real world. Today's lesson begins with harsh words, but ends with words of hope. So listen for God's word to all of us from James chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and you do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and you cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Adulterers, do you not know the friendship with the world is enmity with God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is for nothing that the scripture says, God yearns jealously for the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives all the more grace? Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves before God. Resist the devil, and the devil will flee from you. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into dejection. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and God will exalt you. May God bless this reading to our understanding.
you drive north of Kansas City on Interstate 35 for about an hour, you will come to a little side road that leads up to the town of Jamesport. It's where the largest Amish community in Missouri resides. My friend took me to Jamesport a few years ago to their produce auction. The Amish farmers drive their horse-drawn wagons up to this large covered portico, and the auctioneer quickly rattles off the price of whatever produce that Amish farmer has brought to the market that day. And you can just raise up your hand or lift your number and purchase a few dozen crates of tomatoes or watermelon or eggplant, or you can go back to the back and they have a little table with just some simple flats of berries or okra or whatever you want. And, and I would suggest if you do go up to Jamesport, that you go back to that little table in the back and buy just a little bit of something. Otherwise, you'll end up like me at home with a truckload full of eggplant wondering, now what was I thinking when I bought all of this? But my point is that just a few miles north of us are Amish people living like our great-great-grandparents lived, still driving to town in their horse-drawn buggies no makeup, black clothing, long beards, living without iPhones or Twitter, without MSNBC or Fox News, without Capitol Grill or Chick-fil-A, no Netflix and no next door app to connect with their neighbors. If they wanna connect with their neighbors, they'll wait till the next door neighbor calls and says, hey, our cow is having calves and we need some help over here. That's what a neighbor is to them. They don't use Amazon Prime because they sew their own clothes. And they don't ever go to a restaurant and order the charcuterie because they make their own sausage and their own cheese. When I first read James's words, friendship with the world is enmity with God, I thought about those Amish farmers and the other sects of Christians who have resisted being a part of the modern world as much as they possibly can. James writes, friendship with the world is enmity with God. And my first thought is that James is wrong. I mean, I know there are still Christian colleges where you can send your kids and your 18-year-old will have to sign a covenant that says that he or she will not drink or dance while they're at that college. But honestly, that version of Christian practice doesn't make much sense to me. In the church where my in-laws were members for decades, they had this special musical program one Christmas, not just for the members, but to invite in the community to learn the story of the birth of Christ. And part of the script of this amazing musical program that they were going to put on involved dancing. But they didn't believe in dancing. And so you know what they did? They took that part of the program and they called it choreography choreography. They could do that. That wasn't against their religion. My son attended a historically Christian college in Nashville. Now, they could drink and dance, no problem, no problem. But many of my son's classmates had grown up in Christian households that had banned Harry Potter. And so he said, Mom, the, the students in the freshman class, they haven't read Harry Potter. They think it's of the devil, the occult, too much friendship with the world. So what do you and I make of James's stark contrast? Friendship with the world means enmity with God. Is it, as my colleague Mike Graves tells me sometimes, that sometimes you got to push back on the Bible. Maybe they don't get it all right. Is that it? For example, is it okay for me to go to a seven-course dinner with wine pairings and spend more money on one dinner than many families spend on their entire grocery bill in a month? Isn't that just a gross indulgence? 
is it okay for you to go out and buy a new red shirt even though you have a perfectly good red shirt hanging in your closet right now when you know full well that there are neighbors here in Kansas City who don't have a decent shirt? Almost 50 folks in our church spent two weeks in Italy earlier this summer. We were looking at Renaissance art and frequently tasting gelato as we flew over and we were getting near Rome and getting antsy, ready to get off the plane, my husband pointed to that little screen on the back of the airplane seat that shows the flight pattern where we were about to land. And he pointed up so that I could see that we were just about that far away from Ukraine, from where bombs were falling on brothers and sisters. And I wondered how could I feel so much delight and joy about a life of pleasure and beauty when so many are suffering persecution and injustice. Is friendship with the world truly enmity with God? And if it is, then why does one of the most famous and beloved passages in all of Scripture go like this? For God so loved the world that God gave God's only Son. If God loves the world, then surely we too are called to love what God loves. God gifted us with a sense of taste so that we could discern the beautiful taste of grapes fermented and pressed and poured out for human pleasure. God gifted us with eyes and a sense of smell to take in the wonders of the beauty of creation and ears to hear the exhilarating sounds of a concert. Surely we are not meant as Christian people to resist science and technology and all the amazing gifts of the earth. So what is it that James really wants us to know? When I was a child, the pastor of my home church was Albert Pennybacker. There was this story that went around, circulated about Dr. Pennybacker. They said that when he was offered the job as the senior pastor at University Christian Church, a well-to-do congregation situated just across the street from TCU in Fort Worth, that they also presented him with a generous salary package. Before he accepted the offer, he asked to see the budget, specifically the personnel budget, because he wanted to see what the other pastors were earning. When he saw the pay scale, he said, well, you can't pay me this generous package if that's what the rest of the staff is earning. I'll take the job, but first you need to bring up the salaries of those who are at the bottom competing values. You see, the world values earning the largest salary we can earn. But the wisdom of God insists on fairness and equity and justice. In his book, The Road to Character, David Brooks talks about the difference between resume virtues and eulogy virtues. He encourages us to not only build our lives around those things that look good on a resume, but also on those characteristics that are often lifted up at a person's eulogy. A resume virtue might be CEO of a large corporation with record earnings and the highest paid CEO in the industry. But a eulogy virtue might be worked for pay equity for all the members of the company, including the parking lot attendant, the factory workers, and the janitors. You and I live in a world of competing values. The world tells us it's scarcity. There is not enough of everything to go around. There's not enough money. There's not enough food. There are not enough natural resources. There's not enough love. But our faith tells us that God created a world of overflowing abundance. The world tells us that we should compete. It's a dog-eat-dog world, and you better climb to the top and push out of the way whoever you need to on the way up. But Jesus describes the unity of the one human family, an environment of collaboration and compassion and care for the less fortunate. The world tells us 
if you want to resolve this, you've got to get revenge. But we all know the freedom that we feel when we finally find the courage to forgive. Maybe what James is saying is that we need to focus on wisdom that is of heaven, not just on earthly wisdom. I think of it as that moment that happens on every mission trip I ever took to Latin America. Someone will say it, sometimes on the bus, sometimes over dinner, sometimes at worship. Someone will always say it. How is it that these people here have so few material possessions and yet they seem so delighted, so joyful, even happy when back home we know we have so much stuff and yet all around us people are stressed out and depressed and disillusioned. Maybe James is not calling us to denounce the world but to reorder our priorities. James says, you have committed adultery, but it's spiritual adultery that he is naming. He is saying that they have betrayed the one they committed to give their ultimate love to, the God of steadfast love. James's ultimate message from chapter 1 all the way through to chapter 5. And by the way, you can still go and read it if you want to. If you haven't read it the first seven weeks of this series, it will take you about 10 to 15 minutes to read it from start to finish. And what you will find is his overarching concern. And it's in today's text. It's in chapter 1. We are double-minded people. We try so hard to juggle the love of the world with the love of God. We say one thing, we do another. James summonses us to change the equation to make friendship with God our ultimate priority. But what is friendship with God? My sister has a friend named Paul. Paul is on the list for a heart transplant. So many times this summer, I have talked to my sister on the telephone. What are you doing, I say? And she says, well, I'm on the way to meet a client. I've got to to make this deal. I'm on my way. I hope this deal works. But first, I'm stopping at Paul's. I I made him some low-sodium soup. It's all he can eat right now while he waits for the heart transplant. That's what friends do. They put the needs of their friends above their own agendas, their busy demands, their work with their clients. A few weeks ago, it was 4th of July weekend, and you and I were on boats and at picnics and relaxing and going to parades and doing all that fun stuff that we do over 4th of July weekend. But one of the members of our congregation, Max DeWeese, who turned 101 in March, was flying to Florida so that he could spend whatever days he had left on this earth living just down the street from his son and daughter-in-law. But Max had been in the hospital for over a month and he had become weakened and didn't really have the strength to make that flight on his own. So Kevin, his longtime friend in the church, who is half a century younger than Max, volunteered to help Max with the travel. Kevin, you see, is a nurse, and he's also tall and strong, and so he was well-equipped to handle any medical needs that would arise on the journey, and he could also help lift Max up out of the wheelchair and into the airplane seat and back again. But I have to tell you, when Kevin joined the church, I would have said that he and Max were the least likely two people to strike up a friendship in the church. Different lives, different lives in so, so, so many ways, but they became the best of friends. And friends take care of friends. So Kevin missed his own family's party at the lake at the 4th of July so that he could prioritize friendship. James implores us to, to prioritize friendship with God. James wraps up this section with 10 commands, almost like 10 commandments. And the first one is submit to God. And the last one is 
humble yourself before God. And this word submit describes what friends do. When you love a friend, you offer your full, unreserved, willing, and obedient service to this one because you want to. The text from James gives us the instruction to submit because friends do that for one another. Fred Craddock tells about the day that he was at this little cocktail party. He said they were eating those little cucumber sandwiches, the kind that you eat while you wait for the real food to come out. And people were talking about, you know, the weather sure is hot. I think it's going to cool off. And then Barbara came in. Who's that? Oh, that's Barbara, Barbara Harris. Have you heard about her? She's a gifted person, strong woman, deep pockets, a woman of significant means. She spends her time working with the local police to help make it more comfortable for children who are incarcerated. Is she paid for that? No, mm mm-mm. Well, who underwrites the expenses of all that work? Barbara does. Then someone left that little circle around the cucumber sandwiches and they walked over to Barbara. Why do you do that? And Barbara said, because I have to. What does that mean, I have to? It means she is friends with God. And that's what friends do. You see, those of you who are friends with God can still be friends with the world. But your virtues and your values, they don't make sense to the world. They only make sense when you're standing at the foot of the cross. And that's why I love and respect the people who are Amish. Do you remember a few years ago, I think it was 10 or 15 years ago, there was a shooting, 10 Amish girls in a one-room schoolhouse in Pennsylvania were shot by someone who was outside of their community. It was such a heartbreaking day. The Amish grandfather of one of those little Amish girls that lost her life spoke to the press. And on the day of the shooting, he said, I want to offer forgiveness to the shooter. A group of Amish parents visited the parents of the shooter because he had also lost his life. And the Amish mourners outnumbered the non-Amish mourners at the funeral of the shooter. The press didn't know what to do. They were, they were in shock. All of us were shocked. We're used to what happens in a situation like this, finger pointing, blaming, But forgiveness, grace, compassion, mercy, how could that be? Because the Amish are not friends with the world first. Their friendship with the world, it's colored by their friendship with God.
Friends of God, we go forth knowing that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit goes with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.